Welcome to the last, yes, the very last formal panel of the 2016 IWP residency. Uh, my name is Natasha Durovichova, and uh, I have the pleasure of introducing this final formal panel. But after this, because after this week, no more of these convenient handouts, so brilliantly prepared by our wonderful editor, Kelsey Veneda, Veneda who's over there. The final panel next Friday will be a free form open mic format. We'll see how that goes. Rest assured, however, that the pizza will continue to arrive hot and steamy. So let's hear it all. In the order of appearances, we start with Priya Dalla from South Africa, who's a physiotherapist, a psychologist, and a writer. Her op-ed pieces have appeared in The Guardian and The New York Times. Her first novel, What About Mera, won the 2015 South African, Min South African Minara Debut Prize and were shortlisted for the Etisalat Literary Prize and made the top 15 African novels of 2015 list. A second novel, The Architecture of Loss, is forthcoming in 2017. Following her is Zhu Jianing from China, who has published seven novels and two short story collections, as well as Chinese translations of major English language writers, such as o Flannery O'Connell and Joyce Carol Oates. Her most recent novel, In the Woods, was published in 2014. Next to her is Eros Italia from the Philippines, who teaches Filipino language, journalism, and film production, and the film theory at the University of Santo Tomas. A recipient of numerous awards for his essays and fiction, poems and fiction, he has had a short story um, translated, um, he has had several of his short stories adapted into film, and he is also currently a PhD student in linguistics at the University of the Philippines. Um, and we're going to switch the order there in order to um, allow for a broad new world literature into languages that are not exclusively English. So we're next going to go to Wasi Ahmed from Bangladesh. He's the author of several collection of stories and four novels, most recently the volume The Book of Banshful 2015, and the novel Tolkuturir Goan, which won the 2015 Akta Ruzaman Book of the Year Award. His stories have been anthologized both in the original Bengali and in English, and he's also a translator between the two languages, English and Bengali, and writes for the Financial Express. And finally, Shibasaki Tomoka, who is a novelist from Japan. In 2003, her first book was made into a film. Her work appears in literary magazines. Several stories have been published in English translation, and her novel, okay, the, Engl the Japanese students in the back row will bear with me here, Sanamachi no Imawa, 23 in 2006, won the Mixed Award for Next Artist. In 2014, her novella Haruna Nyeva won the Akutagawa Prize, and she will be uh, seconded by um, uh, Kendall Heitzman, who is the professor of Japanese here, and who has also been a great supporter and translator and translating partner for uh, um, Shibasaki-san. So please help welcome our, our, our writers, and let's proceed. Being the penultimate panel, I decided to uh, address the topic with great seriousness. World literature today, what are the new and exciting trends in the literature across national and international borders? I don't know much about trends. I still wear 80s style clothing. I only found out what a hashtag was a year ago. And apparently, I've been sending out this aubergine emoji incorrectly. <laughs> So now, having to learn about watching trends, I have come to realize that the strongest trends uh, now in literature, music, and art is now either these attempts of understanding human existence or running away from it. Take the book Eat, Pray, Love by Liz Gilbert and Tuesdays with Maury by Mitch Albom. I mean, these to me are self-help books. The trend is Dr. Phil's Guide to Improving Your Relationships, and somehow people have forgotten that Douglas Adams gave us a guide to the galaxy long before we have an app that can tell us who is from Mars and who is from Venus. Spilling your guts in prose seems to be the trend. Everyone is doing it. Tell all books are trending. 
Finally, I have now found out how to win friends and inf influence people. <laughs> I actually did not know about this before. Apparently, Rhonda Byrne has told me the secret. And to actually have a purpose-driven life is to practice Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance. And then after you have your conversations with God, and finally find that Gary Zukov and Deepak Chopra can argue for days about whether the seat of the soul is found in quantum healing, apparently you too can heal your life. I mean, when bad things happen to good people, you can always read a book about, about Miles to Go by Miley Cyrus. If perchance you find yourself pushing self-help books at your local book club wine excuse, and someone calls you bossy pants, you could always respond by reading Rebel, a novel by Kendall and Kylie Jenner. And looking for the power of now, or even finding a new earth by Eckhart Tolle, has never been an easier trend than it is now. But seriously, I'm kidding, by Ellen DeGeneres. <laughs> Latest trends in literature, in my opinion, have now moved to learning the meaning of life and how to live it, or escaping reality as much as you possibly can. Oh, and by the way, the meaning of life is 42, which is exactly my age now. So I guess by now I should have learned the seven habits of highly successful people and how to think and grow rich using the power of my subconscious mind. Well, I've had to be the one who thinks and my publisher grows rich. They constantly harangue me with line edits on my, liter on my literary and obscure novel content, urging me nonstop to stop the colloquial language, to modify the dialect, to make my work more imminently and eminent eminently marketable to a global market. Eventually, I get sick of Skype fights and I relent. I listen to them and I kill my darlings to follow the trend. I mean, my games are Hunger Games, part one, two, and three. I decoded the Da Vinci Code from my flashy publisher's office in Manhattan because my bank balance would scare away angels and demons. <laughs> Especially now that I no longer have a Lord of the Ring. And anyway, they have used focus groups and graphs to tell me what, what makes a book, a saleable book, in today's literary market. What can I say? I follow their graphs and trends. I came to Iowa, arriving at twilight, new moon. It was supposed to be Priyadala and the Philosopher's Stone. Searching for this elusive stone, I became Priyadala and the prisoner of Asuka Brand. Pursued by Dementors daily, I finally accepted that without any MFAs or writing credentials, I now became Priyadala, the half-blood princess. I flirted with the idea of academia and became Priya Dalla and the Deathly Fellows. I clumsily tripped over and ate too much ice cream and began, began to sit alone on my bed singing Celine Dion's All By Myself, writing Bridget Dalla's diary. At some point, the world became 50 shades of yellow and black, and I threw myself out of 100 days of solitude, and I started showing off my dragon tattoo. <laughs> I have one. I tried, to think that thing, I tried not to think that things are falling apart, and the saleable trend in my country is to write outdated detective murder mysteries and then win prizes and influence people. I cannot answer what the trends are. The only trend I know is economic literati mafia. But believe or don't believe me, I am not an interpreter of maladies, nor am I even acquainted with any god, whether he likes small or big things. So this is my trend, a quote from my favorite book, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, by Hunter S. Thompson. Never create anything. It will be misinterpreted, it will chain you, and follow you for the rest of your life. Stop humping the American dream. Mescaline is best. And never give your real name. <laughs> Oh, and one more thing. Note to Professor Christopher Dumbledore <laughs> and Professor Natasha McGonagall. For IWP 2017, please arrange a sorting hat ceremony and pumpkin juice for breakfast. Thank you.
Good morning, everybody. Yeah. Many aspects influence my writing, like sections in the pie chart. English and American literature is the main influence, while Japanese literature is an unconscious influence. Visual art is a vague part. The influence of literature, theory, philosophy, and South American literature on my work is growing. And the video games form the smallest part of what influences me. In literature, uh, in international literature today, I talked about translation, translating English and American literature, and how this has influenced my own writing style. So today, I'm going to talk about the role that contemporary Japanese literature has played for young Chinese writers. Like other young writers in China, the first contemporary Japanese literature I read was Norwegian Word by Haraki Murakami. The Chinese version was first published in 1996 and then republished many times. Young writers also follow his lifestyle. They run bars, do not have children, steep themselves in dress and classical music, read uh, Raymond Carver, run marathons, and are workaholics. Now there are three Chinese translators of Murakami, two on the mainland and one in Taiwan. We often compare the differences between their work. When I was 20, there was a BBS forum for us young people. Young poets, novelists, painters, and photographs are still very fresh and curious. We have a mixture of idols, Jim Morrison, Arthur Raybould, uh, Louis Borges, um, Rap Gwadelet, at the same time, people are passionate about Yukio, Mishima, Dazai, Osuma, Araki, Nobuyoshi, and Kishin, Shinoyama. Uh, there was also a group of uh, fanatics of comics <coughs> and animation. I have to admit that the anime series New Genesis Evangelia changed me quite a bit in my early 20s. That was around the year 2000, young poets and painters lived together in the suburbs of Beijing, poor and enthusiastic. <coughs> For a lot of people, that was the last era of Roman, um, romantis how do you say it? <laughs> romanticism. <Yes>. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> in the last decade, I have read a lot of English and American literature. At the same time, I was reading Japanese literature unintentionally. Shanghai Translation Publishing House has published lots of work by Japanese Akutagawa Prize and Naoki Prize winners in the past 20 years. Sometimes I feel that reading a Japanese novel is like drinking Starbucks. The coffee <coughs> is not the best, but not bad either. We can always enjoy the step of those novels and their repeated characters, expecting them to give joy to the reader every time. However, some significant change have happened without much notice. As Japanese culture infiltrates every aspect of Chinese life, writers and critics of mainstream literature have stopped talking about Japanese literature. And many people hesitate to admit that they used to love Murakami in their 20s. Chinese people invented a new word, xiao qingxing, little fresh or tiny fresh, to describe a style that is beautiful yet small-minded. It became a criticism of Murakami, as well as of today's new generation of Japanese writers. Chinese intellectuals prefer ground and deep topics. The lightness and brightness in Japanese contemporary literature is almost the opposite of what Chinese readers expect. They think Japanese literature is charming enough, and it certainly has Eastern aesthetics. However, it simply is not grand enough. It is difficult for Chinese writers to hide their ambition. The conflict we face is that a lot of people live decent lives in a growing economy, so there might be bubbles. The situation is a lot like Japan in the 80s, but in 1979, Murakami published his first novel. Japan has moved from a political season in the 1970s to a more inwardly orientated writing style. At the same time, Chinese literature is still suffering from the cultural rift. 
It is obsessed with misery and controlled by a powerful mentality favoring the grandiose. Mm -hmm. Japanese literature has still gained popularity among a few young writers. They are the first generation to be born in modernized cities. They start to emphasize the value of beauty, writing about boring everyday life, and enjoy a free and useless spirit. Living in a stable and relatively affluent life has also encouraged many young people to long for a perpetual teen spirit. The reason they like Murakami is probably because he has somehow maintained the status of a young person. This is exactly what Chinese literature is missing. Um, you do not have the concept of age in a lot of characters in Japanese literature. After age 60, some writers start to think of mor mortality and prostate cancer. <laughs> uh, some lament the end of an affair. Some are processing the loss of a son. But Japanese writers are still writing about their daily lives, changes in nature, and being forever young. There's nothing bad about that, right? As for me, I had a friend about 15 years ago who used to go to the arcades every day, playing so many Japanese video games that he learned Japanese unconsciously. <laughs> in that year, he saved all his money to go to Japan to participate in an annual arcade competition, but he didn't win anything. This is a true type of romanticism. I should write a short story for him. Good day to all of us. Fictionalizing Philippine fiction writing, alter narrative platforms and counter literature. In a third world country like the Philippines, literature is a middle class concern. 30% of the population. The average price of a book published in the Philippines is about 200 pesos or $4.25. Almost 40% of our daily minimum wage. But contrary to the claims of armchair critics, Filipinos are fond of reading. It's just that most Filipinos cannot read the literary acrobatic performances of certain luminaries. We read as the result of too many unemployed citizens enjoying the luxury of time and space. We read and we love to tell stories about ourselves and others. I'd call the gossipers non-commissioned biographers. <laughs> More than 40% of the population of the Philippines is active in the use of social media. No wonder we are one of the texting and selfie capitals of the world. We have more cell phone connections than our population. When it comes to literature, we look for alternative platforms. Young Filipino writers are hooked on online publishing, writing, and reading. They have built a community where they can share stories. Anyone can contribute as long as they have access, and it's free. Wattpad is the most popular. I think um, we, we can show you the site of Wattpad. If there are countries who are having problems about their distribution, about their books, or they cannot be read or accessed, Wattpad is here. It's developed in China. It's an app where you can upload your stories, and you can read stories for free. That's it. Yeah. So you have to log in, you have to get your password, and then you can already access hundreds of thousands of stories. And even you can even share your stories in WhatsApp for free. Okay. Most of the contributors of our, and readers are high school students. They write not for the literati, but for their community. Narratives are simple and plots are more, almost formulaic. Characters' main apprehensions are about their love lives, classmates, bullies, teachers, parents, and sibling rivalry. They don't talk much about ideological battles, melting polar caps, vanishing polar bears, and world peace and the meaning of life. If they're at their young age can talk about this, there's something, there must be something wrong with their infant formula. <laughs> they want the storyline, something they can relate to. In contrast to some novelists, 
who write 15 paragraphs just to describe clouds. Come on, what's with the clouds? <laughs> Perhaps for these young writers, loneliness is not falling leaves or the pale moonlight, but it could be a malfunctioning Wi-Fi or a favorite football team's losing streak. They write cheesy lines, often borrowing, stealing from songs or movies. For example, there is a mother scolding her daughter. Her daughter came along with her boyfriend at very young, age 14 and 15. The mother will scold her daughter, what's he gonna feed you? You're very young. Mom, when we're hungry, love will keep us alive. <laughs> While watching, uh, I surmise that they write this be way because they're living in a world with multiple frames. While watching television, their laptops are open with multiple tabs and sites. Downloading pirated films and songs, they are also sending texts and video chats and playing online games while doing their homework. All while they're informing everybody through Facebook of what they're doing every 30 minutes. So in the story that they are reading, if there is a tree, enough with the tree. They have enough of tree imagery, tree symbolism. They leave symbols to the symbol-minded. <laughs> The Philippines is second to the United States in the number of Wattpad contributors worldwide. Most of the stories are garnering millions, if not hundreds of thousands of hits. Some film companies even adapt the stories into films or television series. And some publishing houses turn stories into printed books. Contrary to the belief that once a story is popular digitally, it will no longer sell well if printed. It turns out the youngsters love to own hard copies signed by authors. Believe it or not, regular guys, construction workers, factory workers, and young professionals are into, the, into these online stories. Only in the Philippines, you can find a communal book. Five, 10 people will chip in together to buy a book, and then they will sign. So the author will sign 15 names. That's how poor we are. Some of the stories are far cry from what is considered good literature. One critic said, if this is literature, this is the end of Philippine literature. <laughs> this blames the kids for their lack of literary prowess and sadly and sometimes bluntly telling readers to stop reading Wattpad stories. Let me reiterate my humble observation. Books are very expensive. Wattpad online stories are free. They are high school students. So, so long as they want to read and write, let's give them credit. Three. Wattpad is their alternative platform. That's why they don't bother knocking at the gates of literary circles. Four, their intended readers are similar ages and sensibilities. These young writers and readers and their content will mature. Or maybe the question is, do they really want to be literary writers or they just want to tell stories? As part of this growing phenomenon, some established writers are putting their work on online platforms for wider readership. Some classic Filipino masterpieces are now available on Wattpad, and educational institutions are uploading reading materials and lessons. Telecommunications companies are kind enough to let readers access stories in Wattpad even without credits. Established writers are getting involved by facilitating writing con contests for community. Just last year, a 21-year-old Wattpad writer bagged the grand prize in the most prestigious and longest-running literary contest in the Philippines. I hope these young literary enthusiasts will set the high bar for Wattpad and other alternate, online alternative platforms and be an oasis for all thirsty incoming readers and writers who cannot be part of university life or literary circles. I'm also hoping that doors may open to these dreamers who purest desire is to tell stories. If this is the future of storytelling in my country, I cannot tell. Maybe quoting from Bob Dylan, the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. everybody for being here. In today's globalized world, literature is more accessible than ever before. 
with technology doing, technology uh, working wonders, our individual and collective endeavors are increasingly reaching a wider public. However, the idea of globalized literature compared to globalized trade or a globalized financial regime is not a simple task of literary export and import, but something more complex as a platform of harmony and coherence. There's no doubt that world literature today is an open window. Anyone eager to look in can find it easy to familiarize himself or herself with the contents, craft, the cultural milieu, and benefit from sharing the vastly diverse experiences as a reader and also as a writer. For a writer, it is imperative that he or she is presented with the opportunity of freedom and the choice to break free of any definitive model or the legacy of literary tradition he or she may have been rooted in. What is interesting in today's contiguous world is that different types of writing, literary trends and traditions of various regions are shared and experimented with almost simultaneously all over. This sharing is amazingly enriching and it is up to the writers to find their own voices in their own respective settings, which in turn can render their work distinct and unique. This is happening in most places. Writers are into finding their own voices. It's here that despite the many asymmetries among countries, categorizing them as advanced or less advanced, writers in all their varied genres are increasingly becoming independent of the baggage their countries are laden with, especially countries in the so-called third world. So writing in these places is of, very, is of every conceivable or inconceivable variety. There is, of course, the omnipresence of popular writing meant to cater to market demand. But what in the past was dubbed, wrongly or rightly, mainstream writing is reaching out beyond its traditional terrains, making room for what was once called, wrongly or rightly, experimental writing. As a writer of fiction from the aforementioned third world, I don't find myself caught within the limits of geography, like some of my predecessors might have been. Thanks to, the, thanks to global accessibility and openness. Bangladesh, a developing country in South Asia, where I am from, has to grapple with a lot of problems day in and day out. And since a sense of place is integral to a writer, I do cues from the situations that drive me in my country, because there's the place I know the best. In my case, the reality is important in as much as it stokes the sparks that launch me into writing. But reality for me tends to remain, for the most part, a narrative of things on the surface only. This surface reality has its limitations in that it can at times be a misrepresentation of the inner true essence, a simplification, so to say. I sometimes tend to see it as the reality of the unreal, for surface reality can be deceptive, or at the very least, it is unable to lend a deep critical understanding of the inner content. How much does a visual object tell us about what, is, what it's actually about? This might have prompted W.B. Yeats to write, how can we know the dancer from the dance? In fact, all a writer can hope to achieve from writing is to share with the readers the self-questioning he or she confronts, the skepticism that gets in the way of decisive judgment. Faced with self-questioning, more importantly, a skeptical approach, a writer is well poised to examine what there is to interpret in ways he or she considers appropriate. It's here that techniques emerge as important tools. One writer may find intertextuality a fitting method, while others use parables, metafiction, flash fiction, or any other device. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Here and there, at the border of reality, memory, and fantasy, some novels that have drawn my interest over the past several years by younger American writers are ones that don't fit into the usual frameworks. They cross any number of borders having to do with reality and fantasy, genre, and foreign cultures. <coughs> Kerry Link has won a number of science fiction awards and was also a finalist for this year's Pulitzer Prize. In her short story, 
magic for beginners, a boy named Jeremy and his group of four friends are both characters in and fans of a TV show that ain't aired at unpredictable time called the library. <clears throat> in this and other stories, we have no idea how the action will unfold. And a slightly bizarre version of the world we live in is constructed <coughs> through language. In the novel, The People of Paper by Salvador Plancencia, who immigrated to the United States from Mexico, multiple stories proceed at the same time about a Mexican man going to America in search of his missing wife, people made out of paper, a saint who is a professional wrestler, all told in a layout that has three or four columns of text running across the same page. For some reason, no matter how strange these stories may be, when I read them, I can't help but think about the desperate sadness and kindness and hope of human beings. In the sci-fi writer, Ted Chant held is the absence of God. The author explores people's views on religion via a story in which angels suddenly begin appearing on <coughs> us and wreaking havoc on it. In Red Hand, Kind One, a story about slavery in handed down across generations in multiple perspectives, although a narrative in the, <clears throat> in the style of a grandmother telling fairy tales. Among non-American writers, Olga Tokaruchuk in House of Day, House of Night, writes several stories in parallel. The eerie, the eerie everyday life in a village on the border of Poland and the Czech Republic, together with recipe that call for mushrooms and the story of a monk. <laughs> Through this, she read the history of people whose lives were ruined by war. In Atlas, the archaeology of an imaginary city, the Hong Kong writer Tong Kai Chung, a former IWP participant, writes about the provenance of place names in the city is episode that blend fact and fiction, conveying Hong Kong's history and real reality among the way. In her new work, Don't Let the Giant Bird Snatch You Up, Kawakami Hiromi, a writer from Japan, writes in the manner of an ancestor ancient myth about a world in the distant future in which the population has dropped pre precipitously and human are being reproduced using sci scientific te techniques. <clears throat> These novels convey something that can only be expressed by rearranging reality by changing the way in which we apprehend the world. Young writers in Japan, and in particular women writers, have in recent years been publishing work in which reality and the fantastic are intermingled, or work suffused with a global sensibility. I wonder if perhaps this is because to them, contemporary Japanese culture is suffocating or strange, and they are groping to some shall find their own way of depicting this unfairness. Here is a section from the beginning of the novel that has most influenced me, Natsume Soseki, Tsukusamakura. However, you you look at it, the human world is not an easy place to live. And when its difficulties intensify, you find you yourself longing to 
leave the world and dwell in some easier one. And then, when you understand at last that difficulties will dock you wherever may live, this is when poetry and art are born. A hundred years ago, Soseki studied abroad in London and returned to Japan after suffering a nervous breakdown. While participating in the IWP, I have felt these difficulties wherever you may live. <laughs> the person who has shined a light on everything I have been thinking about since I first started to write is W.D. Zebrat. In an interview, Siri Haspet once said that the task of the writer is to remember things one has ex hasn't experienced. That's exactly it, I thought. And so, how do I remember these things? And um, am I qualified to write about somebody else's memories? There are photos that appear in Debert's novels. At first glance, they appear to be source materials, but there are inconsistencies between the photos and the narrative. Things that are captured in photos are missing from photos. Things that are written in stories and left unwritten, unwritten. Someone has memories and my own memory and the border between the dead and the living. I am fascinated by novels that make me aware of the boundary between the world within the novels and the world outside of it, and that try to cross over that boundary. From them, I gained the courage to write my own novels. Life may be hard no matter where you go in, this world, but no matter where you go, there are people writing, and I am able to lead their work. Thank you. I just love this panel, always in general, and this one in particular, because there's so many interesting ideas that are overlapping and contradicting each other, right? I mean, or complementing, you might say. Uh, I, before Kel, uh, Kelsey's going to go and get a mic so we can have the questions directly, or I'm happy to take them as well if you have them written down. Um, but I wanted to start off by asking about uh, some of you care about translation, or translation is integral to your argument, and in some other cases that just disappeared altogether. Do you, does anybody want to address that question? I, I was fascinated to read. Uh, to Mocha's presentation and to he listen to it and wondered how much contemporary American literature is translated or whether you just read in English and that's a little bit along the lines of Wasi who says there are no boundaries anymore. In Japan, as many books are translated to <coughs> Japanese, uh, yeah. not not only America but yeah. also many countries. Yeah. 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 I, I read in Japanese. Yeah. It, it's famous. I mean, the number quoted is always three percent. I think it's now crept up to four percent to say that that's the number of books published in translation in the United States and the UK in the Anglophone world. So what comes in is incredibly restricted and what goes out is gushing and Priya demonstrated that in her in her survey, right? I mean it just sprays the Anglophone literature sprays all over the world in some ways. So um, I I'm going to read the one question I have here on a piece of paper and then I will just we can just take the question from the audiences here. So the first question and I kind of think I know it's coming from it says, the question sort of is, writers must be business persons. Hashtag Dylan. Tell him to show up and promote us to the world. He owes it to US or us, perhaps. I'm not sure which it was. Does anybody want to say anything about Bob Dylan? <laughs> Here's your chance. <laughs> All right. If not, 
Other questions out there in the audience? Eros, this question is for you, that what's your, the application that you're talking about with free publishing, that sounds great, it sounds beautiful, but how does a writer get paid? How can a writer earn a living in such an environment? Yeah, that's a good uh, question, because these writers would really like to write, they're not after the compensation, they just want their works to be published, yeah. and at their very young age, and because I said before that they're the average age, the ranges from 14 to 18, uh, most of the contributors in Wattpad. So they don't bother about getting anything at all. They just want to share their stories. But then, after it reaches some hundreds or millions of hits, some publishers will be interested to print it, and then they will make some decent money out of that. Do you use a service? Sorry? Yeah, uh, yeah I, I read some. I, I'm reading some of their uh, stories, but I don't contribute. Uh, mm -hmm. Because there is this incident uh, last uh, two years ago when one of the young readers, one of the young readers, how I, I admire his uh, labor, he took one of my novels and typed it literally, word for word, <laughs> in Wattpad. I think Borges had the same idea, yeah. right? <laughs> and uploaded the, my entire book in Wattpad because some of the far-flung provinces don't have access to my books, yeah. and they're demanding for my for the copy of my books, but mm -hmm. they, they're unreachable. So one of these kids, with his furious intention, <laughs> he uploaded all of my works in my in Wattpad, and everybody's. But they were. It was under your name. Yeah, and under my name, yes. and then we trace it, and my pub, my publisher told me, and uh -huh. uh, my publisher contacted the Wattpad, and then Wattpad traced it, and. Of course, we, we cannot sue a 14-year-old kid with purest intention, so we just requested Wattpad to take it off. But that's how it works in the yeah. Philippines. So this, this is world literature and ownership, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, or intellectual property rights, which is really the... Yeah, I, if, I, if yeah. I'm really a billionaire that like Donald Trump, I can just give my copies free, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, Mary? Well, that, that goes along with Dylan. He is the greatest the promotion that, <laughs> that we have out there. And people can plagiarize your stuff and steal from you. So either we're going to be business persons like Stephen King, or we're going to let this golden opportunity that may never come back. And Americans don't seem to be interested in international writing, like the Europeans. They are always interested, and they, are, they can talk. I listen to the BBC, and they talk about international writers. But over here, it doesn't seem to be there. And I still say hashtag Dylan, and tell him he owes it to us as writers to, to, to propagate literacy. Thank you. Anybody wants to talk about hashtag Dylan? Nope. <laughs> well, surely the... The question of uh, having to make a living and, and uh, I mean, the commodity factor of the books is related, but it's not identical with reading, right? Well, let's not make that mistake. It's very easy to think about those terms. And that's why one of the reasons why Eros's presentation is so interesting, because it's a utopian world. Except, of course, as you say, copying, then mm -hmm. it's, pr it's predicated on the earth, proliferation, mm -hmm. right? So. Uh, in contrast to Tomoka, who really talks about these original, inventive, uh, single instances, and Jianning, who talks about Jap Japanese literature from a completely different perspective, like the reverse almost. Yeah. Uh, how many of you are have sort of paid attention to this, what's happening next door? That's Jianning's presentation was so interesting in the sense that it really charted out the region um, a space that's not divided by national literature, but it's divided by, but it's united by some other connection. And that's not something that I was hearing in the other presentations quite as much. So that makes it to proceed with the theme of world literature. I'm curious about how much it actually matters that it should be from elsewhere that's brought in. You're asking me. 
Yeah, no. Okay. Yeah, but can you say that again? Because this is, seems a very long question. I don't understand it. Yeah, yeah. it is. <laughs> That's what why I don't it? write it on little pieces of paper. <laughs> but, but what it is? The question is, we, you gave an example of uh -huh. two na national literatures speaking to one another in a very oblique and interesting way. Mm -hmm. I am curious about other... Um, about the rest of the panel, about whether this relationship to other world li literatures outside of your own mm -hmm. domestic literature, whether it matters, how it functions. Like Eros doesn't mention that it all seems to be inside of Philippines, inside of Tagalog, perhaps, or Filipino. Mm -hmm. does, it, does Chinese or Japanese literature matter in the Philippine context, say? Uh, we read Murakami, I'm a big fan of Murakami, mm -hmm. Paulo Coelho, etc. And other, and this is a fun experience in the Philippines. We read imported books, blah, blah, blah. And then the Commission on National Language translated these books from English to Filipino, and surprisingly, nobody reads it. Yeah, uh, we, we translated Twilight in Tagalog, Murakami in Tagalog, Coelho in Tagalog, and some classics. And I don't know, we, we don't read it, but we prefer to read it in English. I don't know what's, what's with us. <laughs> so the Wattpad yeah. readership is all in English or in ta all in Filipino? Uh, if in imported books, we prefer it to read it in English. But if you translate imported books to Tagalog, nobody reads it. What's wrong with us? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Because I read Murakami, Quello, Mitch Album, uh, Shakespeare, uh, Shakespeare uh, James Missionary, James Clavel in English. but. If we, if we translate that, for example, we have this series of translation uh, from, uh, of, of Shakespeare in Tagalog. Nobody reads it. No, it is hard. Yeah, it's, uh, Beach Album's uh, novels is a uh, uh, bestseller in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. when, when they translate that from English to Tagalog, nobody buys it. Well, just may I, may I add a few words? Actually, translations in many parts of the world, we have seen that translations do have an overwhelming uh, influence. And uh, in my country, I can say that in the uh, 40s or even in 50s, you know, now we had a very versatile poet, Buddha Deb Basu. Uh, so he was essentially a, a professor of comparative literature, besides his being a poet, a fiction writer, a dramatist, and he was a versatile character. So he translated Baudelaire from original. And the translation in Bangla was so good. Actually, the, the trend that followed for a while was not from the original Baudelaire, but it was his translation. So translations may have, but what, what we are, the reason why we are here to talk about, you know, translations do have uh, their uh, strong points. And indeed, um, we have to depend on translation when it comes to, you know, reading, uh, books that are not in English, so naturally we have to. And uh, there's, a, I think, a huge stride all over the world to get more and more books uh, translated. And it's working fine, there are professional translators, and uh, they do, they are, they, are, they are able to market their goods very, very well. But besides that, what I feel that as writers, you know, writers do write books original books, translations, whatever that come their way. And all a writer is interested in is to find his own voice. You know, a writer is more about, you know, finding things that are evocative, that are more innovative. Mm -hmm. And in that a writer, he not only uh, departs from his own legacy, his own tradition, he also departs from his own writings. A writer who has written something say, 10 years back, he might not find that suitable to what he is trying to express in a different context. So in that, trends are developed in that way. And a writer is not much concerned about what these are being dubbed mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. critics. Yes. You know, there may be, you know, say, for example, some historic movements like, you know, those uh, in, the, in the 20s, say, uh, of symbolists, imagists, you know, and they were the advocates, Pound, Flint, and Loyal, and others. But it doesn't actually matter to a writer, actually, what his or her style or the group of people they were writing at a particular, they are writing at a particular time are being, you know, uh, branded as, you know, whatever it is. A writer is more or less satisfied, um, you know, if he or she is able to, uh, you know, innovate, experiment with things as he or she feels like. 
and it is a continual process. It's, it's all over the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, even in the current days, we may mention some of the trends, but in reality, we'll find that these, maybe these were not dubbed as such, but those were present maybe 60 years back. So these days, we are talking about intertextuality. Yeah. You see, we are talking about matter fiction. You know. But when you look at, say, uh, T.S. Eliot's Westland, I would like to find out that West, Westland is a wonderful example of intertextuality. But Eliot may not have at all heard about it in those days. No, I think, I yeah, think he, sure. he, yeah. he didn't. Yeah. Oh, he didn't. Well, not intertextuality, but the idea of quoting. Certainly so was so it yeah. doesn't matter much to the writer. Yeah. It doesn't at all matter much. Okay, fine. A, a critic or, um, you know, may study a writer or a particular group of writers at a particular time and may try to brand them brand the style as something. But a writer is more into finding his or her own voice in whatever way he or she feels comfortable. So is that what you're thinking, people Thank out you. there? You don't really get influenced? Some years ago. Some years ago, I received a request from, I think it was, it was either Asian Studies uh, journal or Japanese studies journal, uh, I received a request to review a book, a new book that was out, on the work of Haruki Murakami. And I replied and said, you know, I've dealt with a lot of world literature, but I haven't actually read uh, uh, Murakami's work, so I don't think I should uh, review this book. And he replied and said, that's funny, we thought you were an expert on Murakami because you, re you reviewed one of his novels for World Literature Today. And I was so embarrassed about it that I decided, okay, I will review that book. And he was so happy with my review, he said he would send me other works to review. Uh, my point is this, that uh, I have said many times that writers are notorious cannibals. They take from wherever they want. I wrote something about Murakami, but doesn't mean I read all his books. Mm -hmm. I teach a novel by Simon Tay of Singapore where the most violent description, they are so horrific, I cannot bear to read it. Mm -hmm. If you read his acknowledgments, he got it from Murakami, the torture under Japanese occupation in Singapore. Mm -hmm. So I think for writers, it's not necessary they read all the books by some literature or anything. They can jump around and pick up anything. I mean, I read Osamu Dazai a long time ago, and it's still in my head. So I would like to say something about, I would like them to answer something about this. Uh, do, do you feel if you're influenced by, you love some literature, you've got to read all of it? Or as a writer, do you jump around? And when you jump around, uh, don't you feel free to jump around? As long as you haven't done, I would draw the line that somebody copied your whole novel. <laughs> but if that person took something and added something, and that person was a writer. So this is what I'm trying. In other words, I am saying there is a difference between a writer of fiction and a writer of literary criticism. OK. I can only um, I can speak for the trend that I've been observing in my country, South Africa, and the trend is extremely um, <coughs> moving. It's it's a bilateral trend. It's 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 moving towards um, the popular American uh, books that are. Uh, bestsellers here in this country, and I mentioned a few of them. And uh, as the South African writers, their their novels are uh, the, the popular ones, the best-selling ones are always detective uh, stories and uh, whodunits, you know, that kind of thing. So um, I I just feel that talking from my own personal experience, and my when my first novel was written, it was written. First draft was in an extremely raw form. It, it had uh, the, the pure colloquialisms of the, pl the the city, the town, the way the people spoke, their mannerisms, um, and the little ticks that they had, or their little um, funny slang words. 
And then when I, when I sent this to my publisher, it was not me, but it was my publisher that decided to slash at it. And, and um, in order to make it saleable, and I was told, and that's why I mentioned Skype fights, because I got involved in many Skype fights, and uh, where I was wanting to stay true and authentic to the text that I had written, but I was also being pressured to tailor this thing with these scissors uh, to a global market and make it saleable because the publisher wants to bank on a saleable novel. No matter how much we love literature, no matter how much we, in our own uh, bedrooms or lounge rooms, we sit and read the most beautiful texts. Um, as writers, sometimes we want to sell our books as well. So um, I'm not saying panda and uh, to, the, uh, to the market. I'm just saying sometimes the publishers are business people and they know what will sell and what will not. Um, and African fiction, I just want to just touch on African fiction. The trend in African fiction has always been sad colo stories of colonization. It's been stories of death and dying and horrible, terrible, um, you know, there, there's just been uh, these sad stories. Well, that's been the, the trend. Uh, I noticed that it's still a trend, and that worries me because I feel that the, the narrative needs to change in Africa now. Mm -hmm. uh, Africa needs to start writing about fantasy fiction. They need to start writing about romance. <coughs> they should start writing graphic novels, um, uh, science fiction. Uh, stop with those uh, stories that tell Africa as this deep, dark place of suffering. Yeah. Their own domestics or Wattpad, right? Uh, well, I guess we have Wat Wattpad, we do. Um, I've never used the app, but yeah, we, we do have it available. And there are people I know that, uh, that use it. But it's not about the platform, it's about the content. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. For me, it's yeah. about the content. And yeah. OK, one more question, and then, I, then, uh, then I'm going to need to remind you of all the other events that I have forgotten to do previously, but please. Mm -hmm. uh, hello. Um, there were some good questions asked about uh, about influence, about plagiarism, about you know sharing content online. And I was thinking about fan translations, where someone you know who speaks mm -hmm. fan fiction. Fan fiction. Yeah, yeah. Well, not, not no, just fan not, translation. Fan translation. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's where you know, like uh, yeah. this happens a lot with uh, with uh, Japanese uh, comics mm -hmm. and graphic novels, yep. for example. And I'm, I'm, you know, the problem. I, the, the one that I thought I had is, you know, the is this a form of, uh, is this a form of piracy when someone, you know, provides a translation of a Japanese comic, and it's, you know, it's freely available on uh, on the American internet or pretty much anyone who anyone who can access, you know, yeah, is, dot com domains. Yeah, that is world literature. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 you know, looking, I mean, obviously, I personally have no problem with piracy because if you use, if you consume part of content then you pay for it later you're, you're still contributing you're still making sure the author is getting their due and you know especially if it's not convenient to wait for you know a book to arrive or whatever after a couple months you, know, you just you just uh, you you pay for it but you know does anyone have any real concerns about about fan translation because technically it is piracy to, to translate something even if it's not available in that language yet it's still technically piracy you know reg regardless of whether you whether someone does or doesn't pay for it later. Uh, what do, what do, do yes. any of you have any Anyone? thoughts on this? あの、それ、それを自分の作品として発表して、とても評価されて有名になったという、なって困るという小説を去年日本で出版されました。so that they can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yotsumoto Yasuhiko. So Yotsumoto Yasuhiko um, published a, a, shosei shosei, a novel about this last year in Japan about this very issue. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, what is it called? Don't make the phone close to her. Yeah, make it Yeah, she has a voice. Yeah. 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 For poet and uh, um, also writing novels, the his his latest novel about that thing, she, uh, the Shujinko, yeah, she, protagonist, mm -hmm. protagonist uh, translate uh, not famous uh, 
夢じゃない外国の詩人、うんうん、詩人の詩を翻訳して自分の作品として載せてて、うん、それが評価されて大騒ぎになるという話です。うんうんうんうんうん、それは本当の話じゃない。本当の話じゃない。じゃないですね。はい、<笑> so,、uh, and, and so I, in the story, the protagonist steals the work of a, of a not very well known foreign writer and passes it off as his own, and、um, it receives a, a great reception.、Um, but then, なんかバレてきて、そう、いや、そう、and then it's exposed and it becomes this、um, scandal.、Uh, yeah, so. その本に。<laughs> Uh, uh, we, we have, uh, uh, mm? I and other writers、uh, talk about the novels.、Uh, でそれはいいことなのか悪いことなのかすごく議論になりました。Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so、um, there's been a, a debate about whether this is good or bad,、uh, but it's something that writers are talking about.、Yeah, so. If- I'm going to take a moment and read, remind us of the events that are upcoming. And should there be a burning question afterward, maybe we can take a very short one, but just to keep you captive here. So, the upcoming events in the last week of this residency really are going to be to,、uh, starting today, actually, this afternoon at 5 to 6 p.m. at the Shambo House. Janine, Jui Janine will be reading together with our Korean novelist,、uh, Lee Cho Won,、uh, at 5 to 6 p.m.、Uh, on Friday tonight, there's going to be actually a unique event the UI dance collaboration in the Space Place Theater on the first floor of North Hall. And this is between 8 and 9 30 p.m. tonight again. Graduate students, choreographers, and dancers from the UI Department of Dance will perform interpretation of text by selected IWP writers in a special performance. So that's tonight, 8 to 9 30. On Sunday, October 23rd, we will have our usual reading at Prairie Lights. Uh, at between 4 and 5 p.m., and that will be、uh, the po- American poet Kristen Inns,、uh, Virginia Ng, for,、uh, Ng, Ng from Hong Kong, and Legodile Siganabang from Botswana. On Wednesday, October 26th, Khaled Al Kamisi will be presenting、uh, his contribution to the IWP Cinematheque. He will be showing a genre fiction, it's a combined detective musical. A musical story and、um, a, one, a big Egyptian hit called Citizen, Detective, and Thief. That's at 6 30 p.m. in Adler Journalism Building 105, Wednesday. And finally, Friday, a week from here, the closing、uh, and slightly different version of this panel when writers will be invited to simply speak about their impressions of their time here. It's a panel called The Images of America, it's open form. And people say what is on their minds. And that's usually a wonderfully exciting program. And then、um, the, there will be one more Sunday, Friday and Sunday reading. And then the righteous will be slowly moving to New York, to DC, and home, we're sorry to say. However, thank you for now. Thank you for a wonderful panel. Thank you.